Hey, everybody, and welcome to yet another edition of Rooted. And I am so thrilled to be with you here today, really talking about what connects us and how some of the um, more difficult experiences that we can have in life often are the portal to that connection. And with us today is Dr. Diane Poole Heller. She's an established expert in the field of child and adult attachment theory and models, trauma resolution, and integrative healing techniques. She developed her own signature series on adult attachment called DARE, Dynamic Attachment Repatterning Experience, also known as uh, SAGE, Somatic Attachment Training Experience. Jo Dr. Heller began her work with Dr. Peter Levine, whom you heard from uh, more recently, founder of the Somatic Experiencing Trauma Institute, which is how I'm trained, in 1989. And as faculty for that, senior faculty, uh, she worked for over 25 years teaching uh, somatic experiencing. As a dynamic speaker and teacher, she's been featured at prestigious international events and conferences. She's the author of numerous articles uh, in the field. Her book, Crash Course on Auto Accident Trauma Resolution, is used worldwide as a resource for healing a variety of overwhelming life events, which um, post-traumatic stress often really is, right, in a nutshell. Her film, Surviving Columbine, produced with Cherokee Studios, aired on CNN. Sounds True recently published her audiobook, Healing Your Attachment Wounds, How to Create Deep and Lasting Relationships, and her upcoming book, The Power of Attachment, How to Create Deep and Lasting Intimate Relationships, uh, is coming to you ASAP. So, Diane, it's so nice to meet, see you today. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm really thrilled to be here, Francesca. Thank you for inviting me. And the book's actually going to be, it's on pre-order sale right now through Amazon, and it'll be available in actually in a book form uh, March 12th. Toot sweet. So we have like literally like 12 days as we're here at the end of February taping this today. So um, amazing. Uh, so maybe, you know, some of the things that we were talking about talking about today included trauma as sort of the portal to spirituality and um, and clearly your 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 book uh, about um, how to create deep and lasting intimate relationships so whichever one feels more right to start with i invite you well maybe we'll start with trauma as a portal to spiritual growth because that that can be somewhat of a provocative statement to those of us that are struggling in the trenches, right? Or that or we're in the midst of unresolved trauma, then we're still dealing with things that are pretty challenging. And so I don't mean in any way to dismiss the struggle part of it, because there is a lot of suffering, obviously, and overwhelming life events, like you said. And, um, but the thing is, 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 in a way, I think it's so valuable for us to learn how to have an easier or more appropriate or more workable, I guess, relationship to our own suffering or the suffering of our clients or family or partners, uh, other people on the human journey. And we're all on it, whether we signed up for it or not. Uh, but one of the things I'd like to say about trauma as a portal to eventual expansion is that, is that um, trauma tends to constrict us. We, we naturally, biologically, physiologically constrict. Um, we get tight. We stop breathing. We might um, shut down in some way. We might disconnect. That's all natural biological reactions to something that's overwhelming. We might have panic attacks. We might, oh my gosh, just so many different ways we can suffer when this is happening or we're recalling it from the past or it's happening in the present. So I want us to, of course, approach this with a gentle and compassionate orientation because there is a lot of suffering. What I would like to really address, and I know you and I have talked about this, is how do we reduce and alleviate unnecessary suffering? There's necessary suffering, that's part of the picture. How do we develop a relationship with that that'll help us versus keep us locked in a difficult pattern for too long a period of time? And then how do we reduce and alleviate suffering that really just isn't that important, it isn't, necessary in terms of healing that particular trauma. So those right. are some of the places I'd like to start. Right. And for those listeners who are familiar with Buddhist teachings, that would be the, the, the first and second arrow, so to speak, or the, um, you know, the, the idea of um, sort of what we resist persists being the part that um, you might be referring to when you say unnecessary suffering, meaning how do we work on that? Because pain is inevitable, uh, we've heard, and, and suffering is quote unquote optional, which sounds harsh. We don't mean it in that way. We mean it in the sense that there's a point where things will happen, right? Old age, sickness, and death to, you know, sort of use the Buddhist teachings on this. But of course, we could use any real facts of life to know that things happen, whether it's divorce or loss of some kind. 
um, but that there's a different way of relating that we can cultivate when, when we are faced with a painful situation, um, but that we might have a hap pattern that we fall back on based on our previous traumas that may not be so useful. So how do we work with that in a different way? Well, I'd like to start with just kind of emphasizing that we don't do anything wrong when we have trauma enter our life. We haven't made a mistake. We don't necessarily have to think of it as, as punishment. Sometimes we think about why me, uh, but really the whole human race is dealing with some form of suffering or another. And uh, we're not damaged goods. If it happened to enter our life, it's the natural part of being here. This is a rough planet. I don't know what other choices there were, but becoming physical uh, by definition is going to open us up to the possibility of bumping into things, getting hurt by things, having relational difficulties, all of that. So one idea that I wanted to uh, start with was, I sometimes say this, uh, that trauma in a way is for the impatient souls, because when trauma happens, it's a little bit like exploding a firecracker inside your ego structure, inside your sense of self, inside your worldview, inside what's happening in all your relationships, and it affects pretty much everything. And uh, then, then what happens when we, if you think of like this, a balloon fragmenting or something, if you think of yourself as, a, as an entity that, that then gets a bit broken, very often how this relates to spirituality where we started today was that you, in these cracks and fragments in between these parts of ourselves, we often, um, we often have this experience of having easier spiritual access. And so sometimes we can actually be experiencing dimensions, be experiencing certain expansive states, be experiencing ourselves beyond ourselves, you know, as, as connected to something much larger. And, and that might even, we might even be described as someone who has um, a quite mature and evolved relationship with spirituality. Uh, the tricky part, and that can all be true, right? That can all be true. That access is really helpful. One of the challenges is, though, after we've accessed it through brokenness and fragmentation, how do we then come back into our body and integrate it and be with it in a, in a way that's healing and that we aren't like out there in, in just in spiritual dimensions, which can feel quite nice at times, and we're not just totally in the pain of the trauma here or disconnecting from it, how do we integrate those two? They're not really separate, but how do we integrate all those continuums of experience? And that's what I feel is really, really important for those of us that are therapists trying to treat people or those of us that are mentors or, or, or learning or growing on a spiritual path is that this is a natural difficulty. And sometimes there's a split between spirituality and being embodied. And that's one of the things that Francesca and I want to address today. Uh, and this happens often when trauma is encountered. Sometimes people just experience pain and they can, can just get caught in the constriction. But sometimes we can also get into the overexpansion, which is fantastic, except that then we have the hard work of integrating, which means we're going to have to go through usually um, right. of the pain and suffering and the specifics of, of what happened or learn how to regulate it in our bodies and become whole and like learn to incorporate our spiritual understanding and our physical maladies or our injuries emotionally as one person and be able to carry that and walk with that and gain the wisdom from that in the world as a person walking around. Yeah. And in some ways that might be balancing like the relative world with the absolute, if you're sort of into these non-dual thinkings or traditions. And if you're looking at things from a yogic perspective, you're talking about union, yoking, you know, the remembering, the sati, the cultivation is, you know, bringing back on all these different parts. And I know um, one of your colleagues, to, um, well, your colleague in the field, uh, Janina Fisher talks about, you know, healing the fragmented selves of, 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 of survival and, you know, dissociation and things like that. And so bringing all of that back together um, to do this more cohesion and embodiment so that we can then experience and have that um, portal inform the way that we then on the ground do the heavy lifting of the day-to-day -day relationality with ourselves and others that can be about repair, about constancy, about boundaries, about not continuing to be little pieces, but bringing a whole sense of self into the equation and then coming from that place with another, um, hopefully, whole person or also working on being whole person. <laughs> right. 
I, I agree with you. I think integration is a really important part of it. And that doesn't mean that we don't honor different separate experiences we've had or different separate ways we've dealt with it, or sometimes those are even locked in different ages, right? That that's fine. It's, it's just that as we learn to heal all these pieces, it engenders a very particular kind of wisdom. You know, Gurdjieff, which many of us have studied aspects of him or read his books, uh, he was noted to say that, and I'm not saying this exactly how he said it. He said it in a much longer, I'm going to kind of give you the short version, or at least as I understand it. He said, the best time to do spiritual work is when the planet is in great turmoil. Well, certainly we're at a time like that now, but he also did most of his spiritual um, teaching during World War II, of course, a deep turmoil in the whole, the whole world. So what I think he meant by that was that the same energy that gets locked up in us or explodes in us with a trauma that breaks us apart, that is so painful, that same energy, if we, if we figure out the way to align with that energy properly and we learn to pace and dose and we learn to do it gradually and we learn to do it within our range of resiliency or as Dan Siegel would say, our window of tolerance, we do it in a way that respects the, the intensity of the energy um, and we slow it down, we shift focus from when it's too much to something that gives us a place to ground, a place to settle. We call it resourcing and somatic experiencing, or maybe in the relational field with our therapist or our partner or our friends. Uh, we find ways to regulate ourselves in the face of these high intense experiences. Then as you are managing this huge amount of energy that's that's like locked in the trauma and it kind of gets often more and more constricted, it's like how do you go through that that point that's so tight, that's so difficult, that usually we disconnect. It's like going through the eye of the needle, so to speak. And then it will start to shift. Energetically, it'll start to shift into out of the deep constriction and the overwhelm into gradually a sense of creativity and expansion. This is a natural um, flow of energy, but we can't find our way through that eye of the needle, that point where it's most intense and not disconnect unless we have enough support we're grounded enough, we're centered enough, we've learned the principles of mindfulness where we can track our experience and be with it and that we don't disconnect. So part of it, as when I think of it as being a therapist helping a client with this, sort of like a birth process really, I'm the midwife, they're, they're having the baby, right? Um, is to help a person be resourced enough to get through that really narrow constriction into where it shifts into expansion. And this may not happen once, this may happen over and over again about different aspects of a traumatic experience or different traumatic experiences that we as human beings find ourselves experiencing. It's a yeah. natural part of this life. And I, and I can attest to that even with some of my clients for somatic experiencing that, you know, some of them get a little frustrated that they'll make these big, and not big in the sense of they're not titrated, they are titrated, you know, in the sense that we bite off a little bit and then we go in and then we kind of, it's not this overwhelming trauma off the waterfall kind of thing that we're reliving. It's that we're processing this, as you say, sort of guiding, holding, allowing gently things to kind of process through that have been otherwise a bit stuck. But that sometimes they get a little bit frustrated, like, oh, I thought I did that, or I thought that we did that, or I thought that that went through. And then, you know, sometimes there's another little place where there's like a bleeder or something that wants to kind of, you know, still have attention. And then we say, okay, this too, this too, as Tara Brock is fond of saying, you know. And how do we not get frustrated by that process and see the process, if you will, as quote unquote, the spiritual path or journey, if you will. I think at some point when you've gone through these uh, transitions and transformations over and over again, you start to feel a gratitude that we as humans and the human spirit is so resilient. So, you, and I, as a therapist, I say, well, like last week, remember you had this phobia of this, of, of, I don't know, a certain sound or a certain animal or something. And now you're free of that. And now we're up against the next thing. And it was kind of a, just something to be so grateful for that we made the progress we made last time and we can apply the same principles. You'll get through this too. And sometimes as a therapist, I feel like I'm holding the conviction that people can heal till they actually see and claim that and feel their own capacity to do that. Our capacity grows and uh, we, we get stronger and we get more resilient and we can actually even handle more distress and stay connected as we kind of build our spiritual muscles, but also our physiological muscles and our resiliency muscles and our attitude about suffering. I have so many clients that 
towards the end of their treatment, you usually talk about that they wouldn't change it. They wouldn't take the trauma away because it's given them so much knowledge and understanding and compassion. But I don't start a, tr a, a new client saying something like that, saying, well, you'll eventually feel the gift of this because I feel like that's an, a lack of attunement. The person's struggling. They're in deep suffering. You know, they, they need, we need to honor that and, and meet them in that place. And I think, you know, there's all these things we can work with physiologically, which I'm happy to talk about, but there's also the presence you bring as a person or as a therapist or as a caregiver or whatever role you're in, just when you can stay present with someone who's suffering and maybe not try to do anything to fix it, but just be there, that's a huge resource in and of itself. So often we're hurt in isolation or we're hurt in a way that nobody was there in a supportive way. And to have you as an accepting, caring presence, meeting the difficulty with the other person who experienced the pain or we're experiencing our own pain. We accept it and stay present for ourselves. This is a truly uh, magical part of what I think allows healing to happen and reduces a lot of the unnecessary suffering I mentioned earlier. I love and that's that. why I was led so much to talk about attachment connection. So, yeah. So let's talk about that and then how that leads into what you just said. You know, the presencing um, is really, um, even if you're not a therapist, uh, if you can stay present or regulated in your own body, and maybe you can even explain what that might look like to people who aren't familiar with that language, how just that presence is able to allow someone else to hold, process, and be with their own sort of uncomfortable experience, right? And know that maybe, and feel really, that like, oh, it's possible that it might be okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's short definitions for trauma and one of them is overwhelming helplessness. Another one's too much, too soon, too fast for us to be able to integrate. But one of the ones that I, I have been really drawn to recently is the definition of trauma as broken connection. We lose connection to ourselves, to our body, to our sometimes our ability to think when we're just... It, so overlo overloaded, um, our, it breaks our connections to other people, breaks our connection to our grounding, God, spirituality, uh, so many things. So in looking at that, I, I really feel like the value we can bring as a human, wh whatever role we're in, to really be able to feel your feet sink into your seat a little bit. We ground in our feet in our seat. You can do that now even as you're listening to the podcast. And that we, we allow ourselves to be regulated. We find our own resources for resiliency. Um, we shift our focus to something that nourishes us so our nervous system can take a little break and regulate. Because it's, it's activating hearing even someone else's story, right, when it's, when it's highly painful. So it's a little bit like getting activation injections while you're, you're being a friend or a partner or um, a therapist with a client. So I, I want to just emphasize on this capacity to self-regulate. And sometimes it's just time. Okay, you just said something really difficult. Let's just take a pause, sit with that for a minute. And I'm with you with this. You were alone when this happened, but I'm here now and I'm happy to go with you wherever you need to go. And just feeling that presence in the relational field between you and another person or a group of people is so valuable. I think we are, I think in a way it proves that we're designed to heal that we have this healing impact on each other when we can maintain that kind of presence. And I don't expect anybody, myself included, to be perfect in this because sometimes you're going to get hit with something that's either really close to your own history or something that you've experienced recently and it knocks you off your center and then it may take you a little while to get back on or your client or your partner or your friend is in a state that's highly agitated and you feel like you're getting kind of emerging with that and you're losing your regulation. These things happen. It just means you need a little extra support either from yourself or from a, your advisor or someone else in your, in your world to help you too. We all need each other's help. We're interconnected beings. So fortunately we can draw on our own resources to stay regulated as well. Yeah, I love that. And as it relates to attachment, however, a lot of times people feel as though, um, they have to do things on their own. They have to do things in, you know, sort of that um, avoidant attachment, auto-regulation, as opposed to sort of if you're integrated, you can learn the art, if you will, of self-regulation, I think. Um, and then, of course, the ambivalent attachment, insecure attachment being the overdoing, the always like maybe wanting to jump in all the time and not having so much perhaps um, ability to kind of pause, as you said, and just kind of take a moment. So maybe talk a little bit about how the attachment affects the relational field and maybe how your book explores that a little bit. Okay. Well, when I wrote Power of Attachment, I really wanted to reach out to the public and make this uh, as uh, 
you know, understandable and applicable and practical, and really to um, include some corrective experiences that support our capacity to um, move ourselves more towards uh, secure attachment. And secure attachment, part of it is learning how to self-regulate and co-regulate with other people, interactively regulate. Um, but let's just do a real quick overview of secure attachment, because that's what we're like trying to heal into. And that involves, um, well, let's see if you go back to the beginning, mom and dad with child, it's not always about parenting. Sometimes it's the child's temperament. Sometimes it's a medical procedure that interferes with secure attachment. It can be genetic. It can be transmitted generationally. There's different things that can influence um, not connecting to secure attachment right away. It's not always about parents. But the part I want to focus on today, because we have limited time, is how that might interface it relationally. Um, with secure parents, they're protective, they're playful, they know how to be present, they're attuned to the child. Not, again, 100%. You only really need 20 to 30% uh, from Medtronic's point of view for secure attachment to happen. Because even when you, you miss the other person, you miss a tune or you make a mistake, that realigning uh, like like apologizing or, or doing some kind of repair, which is really important in maintaining secure attachment, that repair actually teaches both parties, the parents and the child, how they can find each other again. And that's a really valuable learning of relationship skills. It's not about having to be perfect. So if you're a parent listening, you, put, you can take all that pressure off you uh, right now, because many of us, of course, are parents or step-parents. So um, Remember, 20 to 30 percent, it's a pretty forgiving system. But your intention and your presence to be loving and understanding and attuned is huge. And then repairing when you miss it. You're going to miss sometimes. You're going to be busy yourself. You have your own life, your own needs. You're going to have certain things that get in the way of, of perfect attunement. And perfect attunement wouldn't really be good for a child either because they need to learn how to, re to recover from bumps and bruises here and there, you know, exactly. relationally. So it's not like we have to protect against everything. Obviously, we want to protect against extreme harm right? Um, and then this easy flow between connection, like, you know, being available when the child wants connection, and then also let supporting their autonomy, age-appropriate autonomy as they separate, that we're there when they come back, and we're supportive when they go out and explore in an age-appropriate way. Um, and, and I think I want to highlight this playfulness piece, because I think sometimes we have a culture that's so work-focused and task-focused that even if in your marriage or your partnership or your relationships with friends, it's really important to have time for play. Play really strengthens the attachment bond. So you can easily have rituals or skill sets to emphasize what really helps attachment bonding and what helps us maintain secure uh, capacities in our relationships with our friends, our children, our partners, our parents, all the different uh, ways that we interact with people, even with work colleagues. But it's going to show up the most usually in parenting and in um, partnering because uh, those, you know, what's more intimate and there's more triggers that, that might uh, trigger our attachment history. So we're going for secure attachment. I call it SAS, secure attachment skills. How do you um, like know what they are? That's why I want to spend a little time. The book goes into this a lot further, obviously, but um, to know what secure attachment is so you can orient that way and practice even like responding like when people text you or they call you i don't know how anybody uses the phone anymore but um they call you or or they reach out in some way in an email or whatever is that you get back in a reasonable amount of time so if you could think of secure attachment as consistent responsiveness uh Shaver and Hazen did study about that and and secure would be consistent responsiveness I mean just think about how you feel if you call one of your friends you say I really need your help and they don't return the call for three weeks you know it, it's there's like it needs to be a quality response a timely response and a response to what you actually needed they don't bring you Thai food when you ask for Italian right right the uh, attunement piece <laughs> yeah yeah the attunement piece so how is your responsiveness this is something that I challenge all of us to take a look at you know like like who am I avoiding responsiveness with or who am I engaging with in responsiveness with and to try to manage that as well as you can you know and and not that either one of those is bad but to be mindful of what you're doing when you're doing it so that you can be curious about any patterns that you might find either with certain people or more globally in general with you and then say, okay, well, how is this working for you? Right? right. Like, again, using Buddhist language, it would be, is this skillful or unskillful? Not is it right or wrong? Not is it good or bad? Right. But can I be curious about the process, my own mind, my own quote unquote body mind, so that I can then start to shift it a little bit because otherwise it's going to kind of go on default from 
however the pattern was set up early on. Exactly. And, and the, the, the nice thing about understanding attachment is that it's state dependent on the environment around you. And you're partly contributing to that environment, but how you bring your presence into it. And then also you're reacting to how other people are reacting to you, right? So the more you know and have inside you um, the, the, the strength and the, the inbuilt secure attachment radar, right? Or you're working towards that. Nobody has to be perfect about it, obviously. Um, then uh, you have sort of an orient, you know how to enter a situation and try to steer it in that direction. And that helps a lot. And you may even influence how you pick partners or how you pick people to be in your life that you want to do the journey with. Um, all of these things are helpful, but you can be a person who is the light in that way. You can be from a spiritual point perspective, you can be the person that can walk into a, a conflictual situation or walk into a polarized uh, conversation and orient in a way that might bring healing into the midst of chaos or might bring some order in the midst of uh, when things are just kind of losing uh, any kind of same ground. So I think that uh, as we use our own life experience um, in a way that we unpack it, we heal from it, we learn from it, we allow the learning and growth, the post-traumatic growth to happen, uh, we just have such a huge gift just by the presence of who we are uh, to really help other people and help situations. And, and I think it goes global, really, help the world uh, in a way that can be just much more um, settling. And, and, and I like it, the attachment work because I think it really helps us know where to start. Like what behaviors would that, what would that look like? How would we be behaving? You know, and it doesn't mean we don't have our problems. It doesn't mean we never have our arguments. It doesn't mean anything's right or wrong. It just means that we're learning to like orient to something that probably is going to fare better for us our, personally and for those people in relationship with us. And it also helps us heal from trauma. It right. brings us back into connection, engagement, and embodiment. So well, I love that. Things. All those things. And, you know, doing my um, advanced um, somatic experiencing training, uh, the instructor, I'm sure you know, Burns Galloway, told us yeah. um, orient to pleasure. And that's kind of getting back to the joyfulness and the playfulness that you were talking about earlier that, you know, a securely um, attached or attuned relationship can kind of bring into the equation. However, now it's time for me to play devil's advocate. Um, a lot of times people recoil at pleasure, right? Like, right. who am I to feel joy? This is weird. It's unfamiliar. I can't handle it. What mm -hmm. is this? And it could either be, I don't, maybe some narrative that's attached to it, right? Like, I don't deserve this, or, or maybe it's just an unfamiliarity, which this is weird. I don't know how to take this. I know how to do fear. I know how to do sad. I don't know how to do joy, mm -hmm. right? Well, and, the brain, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so just the more of a habit pattern. So that's one piece there. And then the other piece is circling back to what you said at the beginning, which I call it the, um, you know, they call it basic goodness or your own true nature, your essence. You say you're, you're Diane of Diane-ness or you're Francesca of Francesca-ness, whatever your, you know, true um, basic goodness, uh, there's nothing wrong with you, you know, piece of you. Um, that I remember saying to someone once, well, what if there was a box underneath the Christmas tree and in it, it had, there's nothing wrong with you as a present and you could open it up and take it for Christmas and know that because she was talking about things about, oh, I know I can't seem to stay on this diet or do this thing or whatever it is, right? And, and I said, yeah, of course, but what if underneath all of that, there was this and she said, oh no, I could never pick it up. I could never open it. No, no, no. And then I said, well, it'll be there for as long as you want. Right under well, that's a deep healing. That's a deep healing. It's a great suggestion. And I take it a step further uh, from advice I received from a personal mentor. There's like really understand there's nothing wrong with you or me. There's nothing wrong with me, but there's also nothing wrong with the world. So if we look at like, whoa, can we, wh how often does our mind take us into there's something wrong with me or you, right? Or there's something wrong with the world. And that's a, those are very big thought patterns to pay attention to and to to you can if you d decide to play with this make that a little bit of a practice to back out of that when your mind goes in that direction partly physiologically we have the issue of our brain is oriented to survival so it tends to scan for danger it tends to go to fear very quickly it can go to sadness depression very quickly it can go to what's wrong very quickly because partly that's linked evolutionarily to survival so it has a survival function but that's not who we are that's not the, the the whole picture right and if you think of less like being a light bulb that just radiates joy and then it gets covered up by physicality and covered up by trauma and covered up by attachment injury and covered up by pain and suffering 
to peel all that off, it is a very big shift in identity. It's a very big who am I confusion till you learn to accept it and feel it and expand your capacity for it. So I often playfully talk with my clients about tolerating pleasure. How mm. much relaxation or pleasure or joy can you tolerate in this moment? Even if it's just a second and maybe we add a second and then we add another second. That's, that's 300% or 200% or whatever the math is. Big, a big, a big, uh, big accomplishment. So it, it is really understanding that that takes a certain kind of, um, maturing on our spiritual path, but also it's very habitual and it's very supported by our environment. It's supported by the news. It's supported by other people to move into the fear, the constriction, the polarization. There's a lot of um, feedback loops that we are exposed oh, I know. to unless we choose not to turn on the news. I, I sometimes recommend, and I, I took recently a six week news fast and violence fast when I was um, in Mexico doing artwork. And I have to say that every once in a while, that's a really good idea. And, and sometimes I think it's a good idea to do longer than I did it <laughs> even then. But just to, just to see if you can soak in your own juices and allow your own joy and expansiveness to have a place to really get stronger and then, and then you can take it out into the world where it's more challenged, you know? Right. And so you just mentioned artwork. And I mean, I think a lot of times um, for me, it's often writing. I'm a poet, so I write poetry and narrative oh, expression is a way to kind of get that. And I love being in nature with walks and things like that. And even just a pet, um, you know, hanging out with my cats can be kind of relaxing and nourishing. Of I course. Kitty, kitty therapy sometimes. They're like you know? portable art. Yeah, yeah, they are. They're, they're sort of these soft little, you know, bodies that we co-regulate one another a little bit sometimes. And, and that's also interesting um, because they are living mammalian beings as we yes. are. Yes, they're beautiful. Um, so when we, when we talk about maybe um, sort of, uh, you know, noticing some of the things that might be supportive to each one of us, right? Maybe for some of the listeners, how would they begin to cultivate that little 1%, 1%, 1% with whatever the pleasure is in their life? Like what, if they're not used to noticing where the good is? Well, know? first do more of what you love, find out what you love, do more of it, and then actually feel that you're doing it and feel the enjoyment as, and nourishment as you're doing it. Sometimes we just do it kind of methodically, but we get very focused and very involved. And, but just see if you can actually experience it. And even when you're having lunch with a friend, just see if you can stop and take in the love or the care or whatever's happening in that relationship. Um, the meeting that's happening just to see if you can practice appreciating it, practice gratitude for it, practice being with it in the present or even recalling it. Maybe you're recalling someone who's already passed that was a really important teacher or a really important family member or a lover or a partner just to tap into what was the gift of that relationship. I want and to underscore that because I think this is a key point for people and I really want to underscore it. Even when you're having that beautiful lunch with your best friend or with someone that you care about or that you know cares about you, that you could even write there and say, wow, this is really happening right now. Yeah, absolutely. Like, they're, oh, they're right here for me right now, showing yeah. that they care. And, and I, I, I had sort of a gratitude um, I don't know, a tsunami or something <laughs> in November, I'm probably Thanksgiving, right? Right around th November. And I just, I make handmade cards. It's something I do to try to not watch too much television in the evening. And so I decided to like, I sent out like 50 packets of ha ha handmade cards, like two or three cards to um, everybody that, I, that had contributed so much to my program or contributed to my life. Or I just, I just sent like, I wrote an individual um, little thank you to everybody. And I just, I just, just, it was so nice to have that overflowing of gratitude. And I think so often we get so busy, we forget the value of a little thank you note. I mean, just a little gesture. It doesn't have to be a big deal, right? And um, I enjoyed that so much and so many people enjoyed it too. It was really fun. So you can, when you're, when you're overflowing, you can actually express it. You know, I think we under express sometimes all the beauty and all the wonderful things that are happening in the world. I did want to circle back a little bit though to um, attachment because we started talking about secure attachment. Do, would you like me to say a little bit about what happens when attachment doesn't go so well? Yes, please. Okay. Um, 
I'm, I'll just briefly give you overviews of the different attachment styles. And then I would like to say a little bit about what I find helps bring people back towards secure attachment. I think of it as like crossing a bridge from an attachment injury, however it was caused. It could have been caused in your marriage, could have been caused in your history as, as a child with your parents or with siblings. We don't talk about siblings enough. They have a big impact. Uh, or grandparents. I mean, anybody who was in your relational field uh, as, as we go along, but especially in the beginning. In the beginning, there, we, the way we seem to understand this from John Bowlby and biologically and everything is that we're developing a relational template and it's deeply influenced by our relational environment um, and often now the other part of that is it's how we internalize our relational environment and sometimes the tricky part with trauma because we're kind of talking about two things today trauma and attachment is trauma can make such a deep negative impact on us that when we internalize it it's sort of it's like a stone that sinks everything with it uh, we may lose a lot of our positive memory because the pain is just so overwhelming. It takes over everything. So that we might like have a, a very strong negative um, tilt on our history if it has too much trauma in it because of the trauma itself. But also it often um, even more takes any positive memories you had and, and kind of you lose it in the trauma. So as you resolve the trauma, I have a lot of clients, and this has happened for me too, where I started remembering like, oh my gosh, this really wonderful thing happened. I totally forgot about that. Or this person was really caring towards me and I forgot they even existed. Or oh, I had this neighbor that was always watching out for me and I completely forgot about her. So sometimes as we unpack these traumas, we get some of more of our positive memory back that's actually true to our history. So it's how we internalize and trauma deeply impacts how we internalize. But let's go to the first attachment style. There's really three uh, that aren't um, not secure attachment or, or, or it's on a continuum. So you could be a little bit of something. You could be a mix of all of them. It depends on your environment because your father could have interacted with you one way, your mother a different way, your siblings another way, your grandparents another way. So uh, there can be a lot of different responses in there. But usually under stress or when we're tired or when we're sick, we default to um, particular attachment styles that uh, are relevant to that kind of situation. So in Avoidant attachment, now that's what we call it as a child and as an adult, we call it dismissive attachment. But it just basically means that you didn't feel that anybody was there for you in any kind of consistent way. So they, your parent possibly didn't know how to be present. Maybe they were just overcome with their own trauma and they couldn't be there. They were disconnected, dissociated, who knows? They may have unresolved trauma themselves. Um, they weren't present. They weren't attuned to your needs. So you never felt like your needs were okay. So you never really even learned what they were. Um, uh, they may not have been attuned to your emotional state. So a lot of your emotions get disowned because we kind of integrate emotions by having them reflected and shared and accepted. Uh, so it, it can be a very lonely, isolated place. So if you imagine the baby reaching out into the world for connection, which they will do because they're biologically programmed for secure attachment, they may not feel like nothing's coming back. And then they're only, they don't choose insecure attachment. The only way they can seem to manage and survive that kind of undernourishment is to pull back and then really overfocus on self. Like, um, I'll get my needs met. I'll do it. I do it better myself. I don't need anybody. Leave me alone, you know. And they then grow up kind of adapting to this neglect or lack of presence. And they build a world inside their own little bubble very often that doesn't um, include other people as resources. Doesn't mean they can't be friends, they can't be uh, in social situations or you know at work and all of that, but they tend not to work so well on teams and they tend to have isolation as a default. Like when they need to regulate, they go to isolation. But often they don't actually regulate, they disconnect. So they might be overuse the computer, they might get in the trance of, um, you know, it could be pornography or just video games or something that they can do on their own that doesn't involve somebody else. And as a therapist or as a friend or as a partner, what I w want to help people do is go to excavate those original attachment difficulties in a way that's kind and accepting and then also present being present with the person so that they can start to experiment with some of what would be um, secure attachment and find that nourishing and then eventually uh, find the courage to reorient or the physiology starts to reorient. So for example, someone who's avoidant, when they were looking out into the world, they may have seen just nothing, just no, nobody's home in the eyes of a parent or a caregiver, or they might have actually seen negativity, hostility, hatred and rejection. So one of the, the difficult things for someone with avoidant attachment that they haven't healed yet often is eye contact. 
So I, on the internet, you can look this up. It's called Kind Eyes, just my name, Diane Poole Heller and Kind Eyes. You can, I can take that you through that. But basically, it would be, to look, be an exercise of like, if you looked out into the world and you could see kind, loving eyes looking back, like maybe the Dalai Lama or whoever they would choose, or even you can go through magazines and find pictures of uh, friendly faces. What would that be like if you could look out into the world and see kind eyes? And for many people, that's a very difficult exercise. It sounds so nice, right? For people that don't have avoidant attachment or, or a, a, an eye gaze injury, they would be like, oh, that's fun. That feels really good. I love that, you know? But for being someone met. Gonna, being like met, that. being met and in a positive, loving, caring, present kind of way, right? I, the ideal scenario. And um, so very often people, as they look out to find the kindness, uh, that's part one, but part two is can you take that kindness in to your eyes and let it sink into your own being? And that's harder for many people. And and if as they practice this, and, and hopefully you're looking at them, you're sitting with them and looking at them with this kind of look, I you know, loving, accepting, uh, kind, present eyes. Um, so they might be using you or they might be using, like I said, the Dalai Lama or, you know, another image of anybody that has that capacity. It could be their dog or their cat, right? So as they take it in, it will often bring up the pain of the lack of kind eye contact. And then we need to need to work with that. Like, so what's the difference? What's it like when someone's kind? And then we touch a little bit into the pain of maybe the person that wasn't able to be present when they were a child. And then back to what's it like right now when you look at my eyes or you imagine this loving person looking at you, whoever they came up with. It's kind of the idea, like if somebody showed up at your door, unex or you showed up at somebody else's door unexpectedly, and they open the door and they go, oh, hi, it's you. I'm so glad to see you. You know, this kind of celebration is what an avoidantly attached person is missing because they had consistent non-responsiveness. So we're trying as a partner, as a friend, as a parent, as a therapist, to help to create a situation where they can relax into actually having nourishment whether it's through the eyes or whether it's through safe touch or whether it's through getting a need met, like just even asking a client, where would you like to sit in relationship to me? Do you want more space, less space? Do you want me left or right? And you accommodate that. You can just say, how was it for someone to ask you what you needed and immediately do it, right? And, that could be a new experience. That could be a new experience as is trusting that you can take in something from someone else and as you said earlier that they will be consistently available that they will not use it against you that they will not somehow find a way to um, exploit that i think exactly. that's often the fear that then doesn't lead to the vulnerability that then doesn't establish that repair and that trust and it's safer to stay on the outside and not let those kind eyes in. And I think that this practice of doing it with someone that you feel has the capacity. Definitely. You definitely want that as a prerequisite. He, yeah. Okay. And some people do it in imagination too, you know, like they see a picture of the Dalai Lama. I'm using him because I have this wonderful picture of him that he looks so beautiful. Um, not making any particular religi religious statement, although I think he's fantastic. Um, just, just, to start to challenge that position and to start to, to allow that vulnerability to come. I do want to emphasize, like you're saying, Francesca, because I really agree with it, that as a therapist or a partner or whatever role you're in, it's really important that when an avoidance starts to open up again and let their impulse for connection or their impulse to trust to surface, it's incredibly vulnerable way more vulnerable than you can ever imagine. They don't really have any defense against the disappointment. So it, it's really important that you don't take a phone call in the middle of this or you don't drop them. You know, it's really important that they gradually over time find that consistent enough. Again, you can't be perfect. Nobody, I'm not asking anybody to be perfect because that's not realistic, but that they begin to be able to tolerate that immense vulnerability because it's really painful for a child to reach out and nobody's there or they're there in a very rejecting way. Uh, that's incredibly difficult for what underlies the avoidant pattern. So it's really important that we have that understanding. And often the way an avoidant will relate to you because they're not used to opening up to another person is if you show some understanding of their situation instead of criticism. Like it just must feel so much safer to be on your own when people have disappointed you so much. You know, that you, you, you express... Uh, and you a deep understanding and that's what, one of the reasons I wrote the book I'm really hoping the book will give people the language and the understanding of each of these uh, difficult attachment injuries so that that we can express the attunement articulately and people feel like they get gotten or 
feel felt or that that attunement is really highlighted. I'd say your attachment is attunement if you only had one word. Right. You're affirming, you're affirming it. Um, yes. And, and I know we're going to move on to ambivalent because we yes. have, we're running out of I know. time. I know. I know. Ambivalent is, is, an, uh, is, in, is, is, um, inconsistent responsiveness. So sometimes parents are loving and they're there and then sometimes they drop you. They're just sort of like, they, they are get internally uh, preoccupied, which is the adult word for it in their own attachment history or whatever happens, they, they aren't consistent. So it's a little bit like going to, you know, Las Vegas in terms of emotional connection. Uh, you know, you keep putting the quarters in and you just never know when there's going to be a response. So instead of creating relaxation, in the relational field, it creates anxiety and hyper focus, and I'm watching the other person to see when they're finally gonna uh, connect to me um, or meet a need or be there, and I never know if they're gonna be there or not gonna be there, or they're gonna be there for a minute, and they're not gonna be there the next minute. So it's very anxiety producing, and sometimes it's a continuum of reaction. Sometimes there's disappointment on one end of the continuum, and if there's a lot of ambivalence in, in early relationships, then it will take people to sort of this anger, like they're mad at you before you even had a chance to drop the ball, because they're sure you're going to drop the ball. That's not really about you, unless you do that a lot. That's more about their history, but they trust is another big issue for ambivalent attachment, because somebody has not been there in a um, consistent way and often didn't repair it when the break was happening. So it leaves a person in a, you know, on a uh, love is kind of on again, off again kind of situation. And it creates a lot of fear of abandonment. Now in avoidant attachment, there's an overfocus on self because other didn't exist. If you think of it like object relations, there's a self, but there's no other. In ambivalent, there's other and very often not enough focus on self because they're so worried about trying to stabilize the relationship with other people. So sometimes they overgive, they bankrupt themselves emotionally. They're usually very attuned. Uh, they know what other people need before the person does themselves. So they're often very generous, but that they, they then don't ever feel like they get anything back, enough back to, to nourish themselves. So they have to realize that they're kind of training people to expect them to give them everything and to not do that, to, to like look for mutuality instead of just this kind of bankruptcy mode. And also to ambivalent leaf attached folks sometimes because of they expect to be abandoned they can complain a lot and avoidance don't talk very much they're not expecting any response but ambivalence are trying to get a response so they often feel a pressure to speak so sometimes they're talking so much or asking so much or kind of demanding so much or complaining so much that they actually might push away the person they want to be close to. And that's not because they're uh, not nice people. They're wonderful. It's just that they have this physiological link to if I don't stop talking or I stop asking, I'll, it's linked to survival. I won't make it. Like the avoidance is, is linked to survival. And if I rely on anybody else, I won't make it. And the ambivalent is if I rely on myself and nobody else is there to help me, then to help externally regulate me, it won't happen. And so they need to learn a little bit more connection to self, but also to, to take pauses and not pressure, um, but also to literally take in the nourishment they get from the relationships that work. And this is the secret or I think really fundamental key to help unpacking ambivalent is that as you track, what I usually say to an ambivalent is if you could have a smorgasbord in front of you, a banquet table full of everything you could possibly want emotionally or relationally or whatever it is you want, just see what happens if you try to take, like bring that into your body. And they're always surprised that they can't bring it in. There's a difficulty in receiving for ambivalent because it's linked to losing. So they, they have this uh, overcoupling, if you're going to use SE terms, where if they bring something in, they, they, if they, can't, they can't receive it. So one of the practices for ambivalent that really brings them back to secure attachment and fulfillment and nourishment and a lot of relief for their partners is when they practice receiving, like staying present for when people are kind because they tend to dismiss caring behaviors and not realize they're doing it. They're demanding and asking and complaining about something, but they don't know how to receive it. And, be, and they tend to blame their partners or the world instead of realizing they need to practice receiving. So I always say receive 1% more. What happens if you take, don't try to take the whole banquet. I had a client that I did this with in Germany and she said, I'm so shocked. This is all the things I want, but I can't take it in. What's wrong with me? I, I'm just constricting everything in me saying no. And I said, well, that, so let's just try 1%. And she goes, oh yeah, I can take that in. Oh, that feels good. I said, okay, so if you want, you can go for 2%. She goes, oh, 2%. 
I can do. Eventually we got up to 10% and that was our limit for that session. But she said, oh, this is amazing. I didn't realize I was saying no to what I actually want in my relationship with my boyfriend. And you just and, said it feels good. So she's noticing it somewhere, yeah. somehow in her body and her whole essence. It's not just, oh, I think that's good. It's like she felt a shift. Well, actually, her stomach contracted when I asked her to take in every she, everything she wanted, and then her stomach relaxed, and she felt this nourishment. Exactly. So it was even more than good. It was, it was more specific, yeah, but definitely she was tracking in her body, and she stopped blaming her partner. She started noticing his caring behaviors, and when she le left that day, she said, oh, he's going to be so glad I did this session, because she had started the session thinking she was going to break up with him because he was so ungiving, but we found out it wasn't really that he was ungiving. She wasn't able to receive it. Now, that's not true for everybody, that circumstance, but that that is a practice that will really help the ambivalently attached. Wow. And um, five minutes, you want to go over disorganized at all? Or well, do you wanna... okay, I can try. Disorganized is basically when there's too much fear in the relationship with parents. Uh, maybe they have unresolved trauma. They're still scared themselves. They're generating a field of fear. Um, uh, or maybe they're doing scary things like yelling or hitting or sexual abuse or emotional abuse. I mean, when it goes to the extreme. So this is really where there's a marriage between uh, severe trauma and attachment. And um, it's imperative then that we look at corrective experiences like installing a competent protector, like who would be your protector. And sometimes these are like, could even be Marvel characters like Wonder Woman or I don't know who's Marvel, but you know, the giant Hulk or whatever, or somebody that you just felt was really protective towards you as a child, maybe the doctor or the family minister or rabbi or whoever that might've been, a neighbor. Uh, or somebody in the family so that you bring in this sense of protection and also work with safety and there's things that we can do as partners or therapists or, or parents to engender safety certainly safe touch uh, kind eye contact um, responding when a person needs something uh, finding out what helps them feel safe physiologically having movement in your face from a polyvagal point of view that your face has motility in it um, that you uh, learn how to help regulate that person because disorganized attachment tends to be very high escalating sympathetic at arousal because they're afraid or panicked and then often accompanied with disconnect and shutdown of like a dorsal vagal response or a parasympathetic overload we're going to talk about the technical language but they just basically shut down or disconnect or dissociate so you're trying more and more to, to bring in um, boundaries or rules like okay we're going to talk about this conflictual situation for 10-15 minutes and then we're going to put it on the table and we're gonna have a nice dinner and then we'll come back to it later on um, we're just trying to to do things in a way that they can maintain their integration and their sense of connection and their sense of presence, even when things get pretty um, difficult from their history of fear or if they're doing scary things in the relationship in present day. So this is really what the book tries to address in greater detail. And I give you lots of um, corrective experiences and suggestions to help us move back towards secure attachment because we all deserve it. You deserve it. Francesca deserves it. I deserve it. It's yeah. really uh, important and it brings us to love and compassion and it brings us to right and left uh, hemisphere integration so we're using our whole brain and the higher parts of our brain not just our survival brain that always freaks us out and makes us scared um, and it brings us to a sense of all of us instead of us versus them that's gotten so accelerated lately in our world it, it takes us away from polarization I mean it really takes us a lot towards the spiritual path I once asked Stephen Forges like okay once we get into the prefrontal cortex and we're really in interested in connection to ourselves and being present with other people and wanting to connect with them it seems to me like it's a platform for us to move into our spiritual nature and I really believe it is yeah, beautiful, beautiful, Diane. Um, and the book is The Power of Attachment, How to Create Deep and Lasting Intimate Relationships, including that relationship with all of the parts of ourselves that, uh, and those multiplicity of relationships with all of our different parts of ourselves, as well as those uh, around us in our world outside. So thank you so much for all the work you do and so much for being here. And um, I wish you every success with the book. I'm sure that people are going to enjoy it. So thank you, Diane. I really appreciate it. I'd like to issue a challenge that all of us take a, a, a personal challenge to move even 10% more towards secure attachment in our own lives. And I just think it would be the fastest way we can change the world in one generation is if we healed as much as we could, we did our spiritual journey and we learned these secure, it's a SAS, the secure attachment skills. Just think of all the world leaders did that right now. Wouldn't that be yeah. amazing? Thank amazing. you so much, Francesca. It's amazing. So, much fun to be with you. so fun. Okay, Diane. Thank you so much. Take good care and we'll sass our way out of here. <laughs> All right. That's sassy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.